there was pretty much a broad consensus on what happened in Gaza. According to Richard Goldstone's colleague on the mission, Desmond Travers, he said that as of, say, about a half year ago, there had already been 300 human rights reports published on what happened in Gaza. And all of these reports, with no exceptions, they had all reached basically the same conclusions, that Israel had committed war crimes and possibly or definitely crimes against humanity. So there wasn't much debate or controversy about what had happened. In fact, just before Mr. Goldstone's recantation, say about a half year ago, even Haaretz's newspaper was congratulating Goldstone on having unearthed important findings. They didn't agree with everything in the report, but the editorial in the Haaretz said there was a lot of truth to what Goldstone said. But suddenly, on April 1st, about a month ago now, the debate on what happened in Gaza, or a debate on what happened in Gaza, was suddenly opened. And the Israelis crowed, both the leadership and the people crowed, that with Goldstone's recantation, they had now shown that their original claims of innocence had been vindicated. Prime Minister Netanyahu, he said, everything that we said proved to be true. Ehud Barak, the defense minister, he said, we always said that the Israeli army is a moral army that acted according to international law. And the inimitable Avigdor Lieberman, the foreign minister, he said, we had no doubt that the truth would come out eventually. And so now we have to, I think, go through the sometimes tedious but necessary task of reconstructing the historical record. What did happen, if we don't go through that tedious but necessary task, then the assassins of memory will get the last word. So what did happen in Gaza? between December 27th, 2008, and January 18th, 2009. The background goes something like this. In January 2006, there were parliamentary elections in the occupied Palestinian territories. Hamas was victorious, unexpectedly. Former President Jimmy Carter, who was one of the international observers there, he said the elections were completely honest and fair. The immediate reaction of Israel and the United States was to impose economic sanctions on the people of Gaza. About a year and a half later, the US, Israel, and some elements among the Palestinian Authority attempted a coup in Gaza. The coup was unsuccessful. Hamas foiled it. And now the U.S. and Israel, soon followed by the European Union, they tightened the blockade of Gaza. Amnesty International called the blockade a flagrant violation of international law. The former U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights, Mary Robinson, she journeyed to Gaza at this time, and she said, Gaza's whole civilization has been destroyed. I'm not exaggerating. Its whole civilization has been destroyed. In June 2008, Egypt brokered a ceasefire agreement between Hamas and Israel. Under the terms of the ceasefire, each side had obligations. Hamas they had to stop its rocket and mortar attacks on Israel. And Israel it had to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza, a blockade which is a flagrant violation of international law.
the blockade which was destroying the civilization. According to the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and now I'm quoting it, Hamas was careful to maintain the ceasefire. But Israel reneged on its obligation to lift the economic blockade. In fact, just as Israel was publicly committed to gradually lifting the blockade, it was telling the Americans privately, and now I'm quoting them, that they intended to keep the Gaza economy on the brink of collapse. What happened next? No mystery, no controversy, and no amount of recanting can change the story. All you have to do is open up Amnesty International's yearbook for 2009, and you'll read, a ceasefire agreed in June between Israel and Palestinian armed groups in Gaza held for four and a half months. But it broke down after Israeli forces killed six Palestinian militants in airstrikes and other attacks in 4 November. The Israelis had planned the invasion, the assault in Gaza from at least as early as March 2007, but they needed the pretext, they needed an excuse, they needed an alibi. They waited patiently until our election day, November 4, 2008, when the attention of the U.S. public and the attention of the media was riveted to the result of the historic election. On that day, they entered Gaza, killed six Palestinian militants, knowing it would provoke the Hamas rocket and mortar attacks. But not just knowing, wanting to provoke those attacks, because it needed a pretext, it needed an excuse to launch its long-planned invasion. But Hamas, you know, there are those Islamists, they're crazy, they're so irrational. And so Hamas kept saying till the end of December, we're ready to um, renew the ceasefire. We're prepared to renew the ceasefire, but Israel has to gradually lift the blockade of Gaza. Israel said no. It had to be a unilateral and unconditional cessation of rocket and mortar attacks, but Israel would not lift the blockade of Gaza. <coughs> well, on December 27th, 2008, Israel launched its invasion. The invasion, as I said, lasted 22 days. What Amnesty International called the 22 days of death and destruction. What happened during those 22 days? Well, Israel, even reputable human rights organizations, even the person who spoke before me, he referred to a Gaza war. He said it was a war in Gaza. That's what the human rights organizations say. And Israel was very emphatic there was a war in Gaza. Because Israel said, uh, we won the war in Gaza. They were very pleased with the outcome. We won the war in Gaza. We showed the Arabs who's who and what's what and who's in charge in this corner of the world. Uh, we restored our deterrence capacity, the Arab world's fear of us. And how do we do it? How do we restore our deterrence capacity? Well, the Israelis said we won the war in Gaza. But then along came an Israeli strategic analyst and he said, it's very dangerous for Israel to believe it won the war when there was no war. In reality, not a single battle was fought during the 22 days of fighting. Well, there was no war in Gaza. What did happen? On a military plane, it's pretty straightforward. No reason to doubt the Israeli statistics. It began with what they called the air phase of the campaign. By the end of the 22 days, they had flown between 2,800 and 3,000 combat missions over Gaza. Every plane returned, and a single plane was downed. In fact, not a single plane was damaged which is not altogether too surprising because Hamas had no anti-aircraft defenses to speak of. After the first week on January 3rd, Israel launched what it called the ground and air phase of the campaign. The Israeli troops were fitted with special night warfare equipment. Hamas couldn't even see them, let alone tangle with them. So what did happen in Gaza? No battles. No planes downed, 
No planes damaged. Hamas couldn't even see the Israeli troops, let alone tangle with them. So what did happen in Gaza? Actually, we have some of what you might call unimpeachable testimony, testimony of which there's no reason to doubt its veracity. Amidst all of the talk about the Goldstone recantation, it seems to have been forgotten what was one of the main sources of the Goldstone report, namely the testimony of the Israeli soldiers. After the assault on Gaza, many Israeli soldiers came forward and gave um, public witness to what they experienced personally in Gaza. Soldier, there was nothing there. Ghost towns, except for some livestock, nothing moved. Soldier, most of the time it was boring. There were not really too many events. Soldier, I did not see one single Arab the whole time we were there, that whole week. Soldier, everyone was disappointed about not engaging anyone. Soldier, usually we'd not see a living soul, except for our soldiers, of course, not a soul. Soldier, go ahead, ask the other soldiers how often they encountered combatants in Gaza. Nothing. No one. Soldier, there was supposed to be a tiny resistance force upon entry, but there just wasn't any. It's kind of funny. Some of you are smiling. Some of you are laughing. A war with only one side. It's hilarious. It's hilarious so long as you don't read the second half. And for the second half, it's easy for anyone in this room to check for him or herself, and you should. All you have to do is go to your computer and enter under the URL, enter breaking the silence. And what will come up on the screen are one of the collections of soldier testimonies. And then when it comes up on the search function, all you have to do is enter the word insane. At the end of the word insane, it comes up once, twice, Insane three times, insane four times, insane five times, insane six, six times. The soldiers were interviewed separately. They weren't queuing each other. But the same word kept leaping to mind for, for each of the soldiers. Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza, says the first soldier. Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza says the second soldier. Israel used insane amounts of firepower in Gaza, says the third soldier. No enemy in the field. No battles. Israel's using insane amounts of firepower in Gaza. <coughs> One soldier, this was firepower such as I had never known. There were blasts all the time. The earth was constantly sh shaking. Another so soldier. On the ground, you hear these thunderous blasts all day long. I mean, not just tank shelling, which was a tune we'd long gotten used to, but blasts that actually rocked our outpost. Some of us were ordered out of the house we were quartered in for fear it would collapse. The Israeli soldiers entered Gaza, commandeered the Palestinian homes. And from the Palestinian homes, they're firing into the horizon. But these insane amounts of firepower are making the ground underneath them to quake. And so they're told to leave the houses for fear the houses would collapse. So what did happen in Gaza? Actually, the Israeli soldiers provided the most telling analogies. One soldier said it felt like hunting season had begun. Sometimes it reminded me of a PlayStation computer game. Another, another soldier said, you felt like a child playing around with a magnifying glass, burning up ants. You felt like a child playing around with a magnifying glass, burning up ants. That wasn't poetic license. That wasn't hyperbole exaggeration. That was literally what happened in Gaza. Among the substances Israel used in Gaza, among its weapons, was the white phosphorus. Israel always uses the white phosphorus in its encounters with its neighbors, 
I remember as far back as the June 1982 war, uh, when Israel was using the white phosphorus. I never, much pay, I never paid much attention to the details. It had an ominous sounding name, white phosphorus. Uh, this time I looked at the details. Uh, white phosphorus, it reaches a temperature of 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, 816 degrees Celsius. As Ms. Oprah would say, try wrapping your mind around that one. But what Israel do with the white phosphorus? What Ehud Barak calls one of the most moral armies in the world. What did one of the most moral armies in the world do with the white phosphorus? Human Rights Watch put out a report called Reign of Fire. And here's what it said. Israel repeatedly exploded white phosphorus munitions in the air over populated areas, killing and injuring civilians and damaging civilian structures. It dropped the white phosphorus in a school. It dropped the white phosphorus in a marketplace. It dropped the white phosphorus in a humanitarian aid warehouse. It dropped the white phosphorus in two hospitals. It dropped the white phosphorus in Al Wafa Hospital and in Al Quds Hospital. According to Human Rights Watch, the hospitals were clearly marked. And there does not appear to have been fighting in that immediate area. By the end of the 22 days, 1,400 Palestinians had been killed, of whom up to four-fifths were civilians, 350 were children. On the Israeli side, 13 Israelis were killed, of whom three were civilians, and 10 were combatants. Of the 10 combatants, half, or four of the 10, were killed in uh, accidents by other Israelis, the technical term being friendly fire. So now you have to use your capacity for independent judgment. A hundred to one, a hundred Palestinians killed for one Israeli killed. Four hundred to one, four hundred Israeli Palestinian civilians killed for one Israeli killed. A hundred to one, four hundred to one. Does that sound like a war? Does that sound like a massacre? Every time you hear anyone refer to the Gaza war, he or she has become, intentionally or not, an instrument of Israeli propaganda. There was no war in Gaza. There was a massacre in Gaza. But Israel has its explanation, it always does. Israel is very reasonable. It always has explanations for everything. You just have to listen patiently and everything can be explained. And so they have an explanation for what happened in Gaza. A lot of people were killed, there was a lot of death and destruction. It wasn't our fault, the Israelis said. It broke our hearts. But you know those Islamists, they're not just crazy, they're cowards. They use the Palestinian civilians as human shields. Now if I were to ask people in the audience, how many of you are familiar with the claim that Israel made that Hamas used Palestinians as human shields in Gaza, so raise your hand. Yes, yeah, everyone, you'd have to be you know, either brain dead or making excessive use of mind-altering drugs not to have heard that allegation. And it's, it's Columbia University, so you're not brain dead as for the excessive use of mind-altering drugs. Maybe. Uh, and as it happens, all the human rights organizations investigated that charge. They had to. Because were it true that Hamas had engaged in human shielding, well, that would change significantly the burden of legal culpability for the, the deaths of the civilians. So all the human rights organizations investigated the charge. So if I were to ask this gentleman here, what's the most um, respected human rights organization in the world? Not domestically, but in the world, you would say? Well, I think that's still Western. I think it's still Amnesty International is at the top of the list. I hope you don't work for human rights watching this. <laughs> in any case, Amnesty International uh, it did an exhaustive investigation of the charge of human shielding. Uh, lest I be accused of inaccurately rendering what Amnesty found, I'll just quote from them directly. Here is Amnesty. Contrary to repeated allegations by Israeli officials of the use of human shields, Amnesty International found no evidence that Hamas or other Palestinian fighters directed the movement of civilians to shield military objectives from attacks. Amnesty International found no evidence 
that Hamas or other armed groups forced residents to stay in or around buildings used by fighters. <coughs> Amnesty International found no evidence that fighters prevented residents from leaving buildings or areas which had been commandeered by militants. Not one of the human rights organizations or fact-finding missions which investigated the charge, not one found evidence that Hamas had engaged in human shielding. But Amnesty went one step further. Amnesty said even if it were true that Hamas had engaged in human shielding, which it's not, but even if it were true, it couldn't possibly explain the majority of deaths in Gaza. Well, why not? Here's what Amnesty said. In the attacks that caused the greatest number of fatalities and injuries, the Palestinian civilian victims were not caught in the crossfire of battles between Palestinian militants and Israeli forces. Nor were the Palestinian victims shielding militants or other legitimate targets. So, the Palestinian civilians who were killed, they weren't caught in crossfire. And they weren't shielding Hamas fighters. How did they die? Amnesty says, many were killed when their homes were bombed while they slept. Well, that sounds like the most moral army in the world. Others were going about their daily activities in their homes, sitting in their yard, hanging the laundry on the roof, when they were targeted in airstrikes or tank shelling. Well, that sounds awfully moral. How did the children in Gaza die? How did those 350 children perish? Amnesty said the children were studying or playing in their bedrooms or on the roof or outside their homes when they were struck by missiles or tank shells. Well, who could quarrel with that? Richard Goldstone, on April 1st, he issued or published uh, what's come to be interpreted as a recantation. It's hard to make out exactly what he wrote in that op-ed. It's so murky, in my opinion, purposely so, but that's beside the point. Uh, Ms. Richard Goldstone is a uh, distinguished jurist. If he uh, wanted to be more precise in his words, he could have been more pre precise. He chose to be murky, and he chose to let his words be interpreted as they were then interpreted by the Israeli government. So we have to go by the interpretation. Uh, if he didn't want those interpretations, he certainly had the legalistic capacity to assure that he wouldn't be mis misunderstood. Well, Mr. Goldstone says, on the basis of new information, he's concluded that civilians were not intentionally targeted as a matter of policy. Civilians were not intentionally targeted as a matter of policy. If he means by this that Israel did not have a systematic policy of targeting Gaza's civilian population for murder, and then his recantation was unnecessary because the Goldstone Report never made such a claim. If the Goldstone Report had said, if the Goldstone Report had alleged that Israel had a systematic policy of targeting Palestinian civilians for murder, then it would have had to enter the charge of genocide against Israel. It never even came close to entertaining such a charge, uh, let alone leveling it, in fact. Other reports did come close. The Dugard Report is an excellent report. It did come close. The Goldstone Report never even came close to leveling a charge of genocide against Israel. So Goldstone's recantation was, if he meant, if he meant that Israel had a systematic policy of targeting civilians, his recantation was completely unnecessary because the Goldstone Report never said it. What the report did say was that Israel's invasion of Gaza was, and now I'm quoting the report, a deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize the civilian population. A deliberately disproportionate attack designed to punish, humiliate, and terrorize the civilian population. Well, anyone who's read the Goldstone Report, and unfortunately virtually everyone who comments on it hasn't read it. In fact, some people have clearly not, and I'm being very serious, some people have not even gotten past the executive summary. If you read a commentary in the New York Review of Books, where the fellow writes uh, his commentary on the Goldstone recantation. And he says, the Gold, uh, Goldstone's recantation rectifies the egregious error of the original report of not attacking Hamas. Well, look, this fellow didn't get past the title. It's not possible. No, it's not possible 
The report, the report runs to 575 pages, and between 10 and 20 percent is devoted to attacking Hamas. How could you possibly say it rectifies the egregious error of not condemning Hamas? That's the problem. People comment and they, haven't have, they don't have a clue what's in the report. In fact, the report does assemble compelling evidence that as a matter of policy, Israel resort to indiscriminate, disproportionate force against the civilian population. That's not exactly news. That's what every soldier said. That Israel used insane amounts of firepower against the civilian population. In fact, the Israeli leaders were not shy at all about what they did in Gaza. Sipi Livni, as the attack was winding down, she said, and now I'm quoting her, Hamas now understands that when you fire on Israel's citizens, it responds by going wild. And this is a good thing. The day after the attack, Tzipi Livni was interviewed on Channel 10 News in Israel. And this is what she said. Israel demonstrated real hooliganism during the course of the recent operation, which is what I demanded. And then Sipi Livni, she was shocked. She was bewildered. It just wouldn't compute for her when she was threatened with war crimes, uh, uh, serving papers for war crimes. Because she thought, you know, the Geneva Conventions protected her. Uh, her right to conduct, uh, the Israeli army to conduct itself with real hooligan hooliganism. By going wild in Gaza. A former Israeli defense official he said to the International Crisis Group, with an armada of fighter planes attacking Gaza, Israel decided to play the role of a mad dog for the sake of future deterrence. A former senior Israeli security official, he boasted that Israel had regained its deterrence. How? And now I'm quoting him. Israel has shown Hamas, Iran, and the region that it can be as lunatic as any of them. A leading Israeli commentator in Arab affairs, he said, the Goldstone report, which claimed that Israel goes crazy when it is being attacked, caused us some damage. But it was a blessing in our region. If Israel goes crazy and destroys everything in its way when it is being attacked, one should be careful. No need to mess with crazy people. Well, what's the law on this? The law is pretty straightforward on these matters, although there seems to be a lot of confusion when the law is discussed when it comes to Israel, or for that matter, the US. There's a basic principle of law, and the principle is that the doer of an act must be taken to have intended its natural and foreseeable consequences. The doer of an act must be taken to have intended its natural and foreseeable consequences. I heard that uh, Mr. Weiss was introduced as having been involved in the 1996, I guess, uh, International Court of Justice decision on the nuclear weapons. Well, I'm quoting from that decision. That was Judge Vera Mantri. So, an indiscriminate, disproportionate attack that inevitably and predictably results in civilian deaths is indistinguishable from a deliberate and intentional attack on civilians. That's just very straightforward. If you go into a civilian neighborhood and you just fire indiscriminately and disproportionately in that neighborhood, it counts as an intentional attack on civilians because the inevitable and foreseeable outcome the inevitable and foreseeable outcome of attacking indiscriminately and disproportionately a civilian neighborhood is that civilians are going to die. Israel's leading authority in international law is a fellow named Yoram Dinstein. He's a very smart guy, no question about it. He's also a dreadful apologist for Israel. There's also no question about that. Well, he's a judge. I mean, he's a, a lawyer. That's his job. He, uh, but he's a smart guy, no question. And if you look in his standard book on international law and conflict, he says, and now I'm quoting him, there is no genuine difference between a premeditated attack and an indiscriminate attack against civilians. They're the same. 
There's no genuine difference, that's Dinstein speaking, between a premeditated attack on civilians and an indiscriminate attack on civilians. He says they are equally forbidden. If Goldstone now believes that because Israel did not intentionally target civilians for murder, it is not guilty of war crimes, then he ought to brush up on the law. An indiscriminate, disproportionate attack on civilians is no less criminal than a conventionally intentional attack. If Mr. Goldstone now believes that it is not criminal behavior for an invading army to go wild, to demonstrate real hooliganism, to carry on like a mad dog, to act lunatic and act crazy, to destroy everything in its way, then he should not be practicing law. But uh, time won't allow me to go into it. I don't believe he believes any of that. I honestly don't. Uh, it's hard to account for uh, his recantation. It's a matter of speculation. But I, I do not think he could possibly believe uh, that what Israel did in Gaza requires any rethinking. It was a, a merciless, heartless uh, massacre of a defenseless population. And no number of recantations and no attempts to cleanse the memory of what happened is going to change that. Thank you. Since both Bashir and Norman have mentioned my role at the International Court of Justice on Nuclear Weapons, um, I think I should tell you that last year I had an article in the Palestine Israel Journal on Israel's obligation, to legal obligation, to get rid of its nuclear weapons. It's not going to persuade Netanyahu. It may not even persuade anybody else in a position of power in Israel. But it's significant because five years ago, the Palestine Israel Journal could not have published a special issue on the question of nuclear weapons. So a little progress is possible from time to time. Now, I want to make an announcement. I don't know if there's any press here, but this is really a momentous announcement. I'm thinking of bringing a reverse uh, class action against the entire mainstream journalistic community. <laughs> both in this country and elsewhere. <laughs> because what they have done with Goldstone's so-called retraction or recantation is a crime. I think they did it partly because they were disposed to interpret what he wrote in the Washington Post as a recantation. But I think they also did it because they're very bad at close reading of texts. <laughs> How many of you think that they actually read the McGowan Davis report? How many here have heard of the McGowan Davis report? Okay, about three people. Well, when the Goldstone Report came out, um, I eventually said that I thought I was one of five people who had read the whole thing. I think I'm probably not one of three people <laughs> who have read the 76 pages of the McGowan Davis Report. Let me tell you what that is. There was a set of recommendations at the end of the Goldstone Report. And the main recommendation really was one for accountability. And Goldstone said there had to be investigations, there had to be 
indictments, there had to be trials. Uh, this was at a time when he believed that very serious war crimes had been committed. And incidentally, the one thing, Norman, that I disagree with you slightly about, because uh, everything up to that point I have absolutely no problem with. But I, I disagree with you when you say that now he's saying that there were no war crimes. I don't think he's saying that, but I'll come to that. So, that recommendation went to the United Nations Human Rights Council. And the Human Rights Council decided to appoint a second commission to determine what both parties, Hamas and Israel, were doing to implement Goldstone's recommendation. And that is the McGowan Davis Commission. McGowan Davis, it's a double name, is the name of a, uh, an American woman judge, also very courageous, as Goldstone was when he wrote his report, who together with a Swedish judge held interviews with a great many people in the Israeli and Hamas and PA authority structure. But, like Goldstone, they were not admitted to Israel and they were prevented by Israel from going into Gaza. So they had to have people come to Jordan to tell them what was happening. And they put out this report in which they said, we have found that 400 investigations have been or are being conducted based on complaints that were filed about the horror that was Operation Cast Lead. But, and then they said, as a result of those 400 investigations, there were three indictments. And two of them resulted in disciplinary action. One of them was about the theft of a credit card by an Israeli soldier and he got a seven-month sentence. The second conviction was about an Israeli soldier who used a Palestinian child as a shield, and he got a suspended sentence. And the third one is still in progress out of the 400 cases. So, the real mystery of the so-called recantation is that the logic of the recantation is really impossible to follow. Richard Goldstone said in his Washington Post op-ed piece, I have now read the McGowan Davis report and I find that um, 400 cases were actually opened. And so therefore, I no longer believe in the intentionality of what happened in the past. I, 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 don't, I don't know how you get a logical proposition out of that. In the past, he said he believed that there was actually and intention to do all the things that Norman was talking about, to teach Hamas a lesson, to go wild, and, and so forth. And now that he knows that there have been subsequently these investigations, which incidentally haven't led to anything, he no longer believes 
in intentionality. Someday I'd, I'd really like to be able to sit down with Richard Goldstone, for whom I have a great deal of admiration going back to the days when he was one of the lone voices against apartheid in South Africa. Uh, and ask him, you know, how he came to that conclusion. Uh, now, the other thing that is very important to recognize about the retraction or the recantation is that the intentionality was the only thing that Goldstone retracted. He in no way said, I no longer believe in the facts that we found. And the facts that they found were the sort of thing that Bashir was talking about that we saw in the video and that Norman talked about. So this so-called recantation was a, was a highly partial recantation. And I think he did it because the intentionality in the original report was the thing that made him an outcast in his community. It wasn't really so much the findings of the commission, because you know what? A lot of the people who are now congratulating him on his recantation really don't have a lot of problems with the facts. They only have problems with saying that Israel set out to commit these terrible things and the order came down from above. Now the order may or may not have come down from above. And I think we have to analyze a little bit this question of what was intended and what actually happened. Um, you mentioned Sipi Livnes. There were other statements by other high officials. There was the question during the Lebanon War of the Daya Doctrine, which was promoted by General Eisenkopf, who was the commander of the northern region and who sent his soldiers into a neighborhood of Beirut called Dahia, where there were believed to be, and there probably actually were, some command and control centers of um, Hezbollah. And he destroyed the entire neighborhood. I mean, the soldiers destroyed the entire neighborhood. And then he said, and that's what we're going to do from now on, everywhere. Every place we find, say, a village in which Hezbollah or Hamas has an operation center, that village is going to be destroyed. Right? That's the, that's the Dahia doctrine. Now, if you said, you know, if Netanyahu happened to be here, which isn't very likely, he would say, well, that, that was never official policy. I, I mean, General Eisenkopf said that, and Sipi Livni said that, and, and the Deputy Prime Minister, quoted by Norman, said that, but it wasn't official policy. And my answer to that would be, it doesn't matter whether it was official policy or not. Chances are that it was official but unannounced, unadmitted policy. But under international law, it is sufficient for the organs in charge of an operation to fail to take action to prevent 
war crimes and massacres, it is sufficient to place responsibility for those war crimes and those massacres with the people higher up who didn't do anything to stop it. Whether they proclaimed it as official policy or not. So, the damage from the recantation, I think, has to be understood as being very limited in scope. And you have to remember very clearly that there was no retraction of the findings of fact. There were 36 separate instances listed in the Goldstone Report of possible war crimes. And Goldston always went out of his way to say, we are not uh, preparing a legal case. We are making findings of fact here which could or could not result in, in prosecution. But there were 36 of them, and they were clearly listed in the report as possible war crimes. And then he says there was one instance, he says in the Washington Post, where we were probably wrong. And that was the misreading of the drone report that resulted in the death of 29 members of one family. Now, you know, there's something called collateral damage in international human rights law. So whether the drone report was accurate or not, in my view, does not excuse the launching of a bomb on a, on a building that was known to be occupied by civilians at the time. I think I was supposed to say something about international humanitarian law, and I'm happy to do it here because while international humanitarian law, which is the law of war, which is that part of the law of war which deals with what you are permitted or forbidden to do in war fighting, has a very ancient history. I mean, it goes back thousands of years. And one example that is frequently cited is that at the uh, Lateran Council of 1139, that council prohibited the use of cross, crossbows, crossbows as being hateful, hateful to God and unfit for Christians. 1139, okay? Modern international humanitarian law actually goes back to Columbia University. There was a German law professor, professor of military law named Lieber, who was uh, moved by the horrors of the Civil War in this country to draw up a list of of, of what was permitted and what was forbidden in, in war. And he took it to President Lincoln, and Lincoln promulgated it as orders to the armies of the United States. And I'm just going to read you a couple of things from what has come to be known as the Lieber Code, 1863. This is what it says, among other things. Military oppression is not martial law. It is the abuse of that law. The law of war disclaims all cruelty and bad faith. Offenses shall be severely punished, and especially so if committed by officers. This is important, especially so if committed by officers. One thing that the Goldstone Report recommended 
was that there be investigation not only of the individual instances of possible war crimes in the report, but that there should also be an investigation of the design of Operation Castlet and its implementation at the high, at higher levels. And McGowan Davis says it never happened. And Goldstone, in his Washington Post op-eds piece, says it never happened. And the legal court also said military necessity admits of all direct destruction of life or limb of armed enemies and of other persons whose destruction is incidentally unavoidable. Original emphasis, unavoidable. But military necessity does not admit of cruelty. Um, I'm not going to give you the whole development of international humanitarian law from 1863 to the Geneva Conventions of 1949. But this is the kernel of it. This is where it was born, and Colombia should be proud of it. Probably is. <laughs> You talked about disproportionality, Norman, and about the, uh, the statements that were made by various people in high places. I want to mention briefly something that uh, is in my Goldstone file that I saw yesterday, an article by an Israeli lawyer named Michael Sfart, who frequently defends Palestinians. And he says the reason Israel and Jewish communities throughout the world were so upset by the Goldstone Report <coughs> is in paragraph 26 of that report where he talks about the inadequacy of military justice. And he points out that during the first intifada most complaints filed with, they call it the investigative military police, were followed up. And from the time of the second intifada, there was no longer any automatic follow-up of a complaint. From the second intifada on, by order of the military attorney general, before the military police could investigate an alleged incident of war crime, or rape, massacre, whatever. There had to be first an operational investigation. <clears throat> Meaning what? Meaning that it had to be investigated by the same chain of command at the bottom of which were the perpetrators of that crime. And McDonald Davis points out in her report that that is totally at odds with what international law requires as a proper kind of investigation of alleged war crimes. Incidentally, I said before that occasionally things move forward a little bit. I think as a result of the Goldstone Report, the uh, procedure in Israel it has now been redefined as in, 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 in such a way that any complaint that is filed of military abuse, torture, whatever, has to have automatically an investigation by the military police. So it's not only going back to what it was before the Second Intifada, but it's, it's even going a little beyond that. Well, time is marching on, but I can't resist drawing a little 
parallel between what we're talking about here and what some of you may have read in the Sunday Times magazine yesterday. The main article there was called The Beast in the Heart. And the title is based on a quote from General George Marshall as a very young officer in the Philippines in 1902, when he said something along these lines. When you send young people into war, they have a, a beast in their heart to kill and to do damage. And it is up to their superiors to chain that beast. And if the superiors don't do it, it won't happen. And the beast will run loose and do its damage. It, it, is, it is really a very, very interesting long article based on interviews with young American soldiers who set out deliberately as in Gaza, to kill people in Afghanistan. And the worst part of it, the worst part of that article, is a section in which the father of one of these soldiers, a guy named Winfield, whose father is a former Marine, kept getting emails from his son saying, there are murders being committed here by my fellow soldiers. What should I do? And then he sent his father one and he said, there is a specific plan to create a scenario where it will be okay to kill an, Afghan, an Afghanistani man. And his father called about 10 different people in the military senatorial offices and nobody did anything about it. So accountability, I think, is the key to all of this. And the Goldstone so-called recantation or retraction is still firmly on the absolute need for accountability for these crimes. And sooner or later, maybe it will actually happen.